Hello, everybody. Welcome to this last session of the live events for National Thrombosis Week. Last, but certainly not least. Um, I'm just going to walk you through a preamble, which allows time for more people to come in. Um, to remind you that National Thrombosis Week has been a great success this year. We've had over 2,300 people register uh, from 53 countries, uh, and there are 54 members of the faculty here. It's really been a tremendous week, and thank you, Joe, for all of your efforts in organizing it. So the learning can continue. All of the lectures will be available online until the 31st of May. Um, can I ask the audience, you may well have questions. So can you use the chat or the Q&A areas? And we can either answer your questions by text or can discuss them at the end. Uh, we are going to take questions after each presentation because they're so very disparate this afternoon, uh, it would seem sensible to do so. And we'll try to include as many as possible. So it's uh, something to be said that we know there are two causes of thrombosis in normal vessels. And that is either a thrombophilic state or inflammation in the vessel wall. And we know that Bechet syndrome is probably the most or the best example of inflammation. And so it's a real delight to have my colleague from Guy's and St. Thomas's, Professor David de Cruz here to walk us through Bechet's and thrombosis. David's a leading consultant in connective tissue disorders. He's a consultant rheumatologist he particularly specializes in lupus, relapsing polychondritis and vasculitis, among other rheumatological conditions. He practices at the Louise Coote Lupus Unit at Guy's, and he is also chair of the St. Thomas's Lupus Trust. He has done a lot of research. He's involved with uh, King's College School of Medicine. He's got over 130 peer-reviewed papers 60 editorials and reviews and 15 book chapters. So David, over to you. Thank you very much for coming. Great. Thank you very much, Beverly. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so as Beverly said, I have an interest in sort of inflammatory rheumatology, as it were, lupus and vasculitis. And Betchett's is a prime example uh, of this condition. So let me just take you through this. Here are my disclosures, none of which are actually relevant to this talk. Um, and here's some references you might want to look at. So Betchett's classification criteria, uh, management of vascular disease, which I will touch on, and how to manage uh, clinical disease by Hassan Yazici, who's one of the probably the leading light uh, on Betchett's disease from Turkey. So um, let me just. Uh, so Betchett's is not, not a new disease. Uh, it was actually described in the 5th century BC by the Hippocratic physicians, um, who probably picked it up, but obviously didn't call it Betchett's at that time. Uh, by 1922 and then 1930, uh, there were case reports that were very likely to be Betchett's disease. And then Benedictos Adamantiades, Adamantiades a Greek ophthalmologist, uh, almost certainly described the patient with Betchett's disease. And some, some colleagues call this uh, Adamantiades Betchett's uh, disease. Uh, I think we're moving away from epon eponyms these days. But anyway, in 1937, it was Professor Hulusi Betchet, uh, Betchet in um, in Turkey who described three patients with the full-blown syndrome uh, of oral and genital ulceration, uveitis, and erythema nodosum uh, in the archives of dermatology and venereal disease. So the ge geoepidemiology of Betchet's is quite interesting. It's mostly in tropical and subtropical countries. You can see there is a gradient of prevalence. Uh, you can see the disease is quite rare in northern climes like United Kingdom. It's 0 0.64 per 100,000, whereas in Turkey, it's 370 uh, per 100,000. And they have huge Betchet's clinics in, in, in Turkey. And um, the traditional thinking is that the prevalence is increased along the so-called old silk route uh, where silk was transported from china to the middle east and other parts of the world um, and um, so there is a, a geoepidemiology and there's also a genetic link which I, i'll come back to so this is quite an interesting aspect so <clears throat> the international criteria uh, for classification of betchett's disease 
Um, and I think, as always in rheumatology, uh, one should not use classification criteria to diagnose the disease, but there are a really very useful checklist when you're thinking about the diagnosis to, to go through this checklist to see if your patient might fit the bill. So classification criteria are really for research, um, and they're designed to be very highly specific, but they're not very sensitive. So uh, this will be a theme through the talk, uh, oral ulcers, ocular lesions, uh, skin lesions, and neurological manifestations, and of course, vascular manifestations. The pathogy test is a bit of a vexed question. Uh, so the pathogy test is done by uh, scratching the skin, um, sometimes with other things. And if you get a reaction, that's said to be very specific for Betchett's. But it seems to be very uncommonly positive in Caucasian countries. Certainly, I've never seen a, or very rarely seen a positive pathogy test uh, here. Uh, sometimes little clues when they've had blood taken, you might see a little reaction around the venipuncture site. Um, but this seems to be a more common manifestation in the Middle Eastern countries. So Betchett's is a totally clinical diagnosis. There is no pathognomonic blood test that you can do. Uh, so because it's a rare disease, at least in, in this country in Europe, you have to think of the diagnosis, otherwise you'll miss it. So the classic features are all on the slide, oral and genital ulceration, ocular disease, especially uveitis, papillopustular lesions and folliculitis, erythema nodosum, and inflammatory arthritis, which is often symmetrical, uh, and then vascular disease, which I'll spend some time uh, talking about. There is a genetic association, HLA-B51, uh, but a negative HLA-B51 does not exclude the diagnosis. And HLA-B51 is obviously less common uh, in Caucasian populations, but obviously more common uh, along the Silk Route, as I mentioned. So we're talking about vascular disease. So the, the classic features of uh, vascular disease in Betchett's, these are inflammatory complications, pulmonary artery aneurysms, uh, venous thromboembolic phenomena, uh, and thrombophlebitis. And I've got a couple of case studies that just illustrate uh, these problems. So the first patient is a 19-year-old uh, young man, mixed Nigerian and uh, in English ancestry, and a few years ago presented with a two-day history of hemoptysis to his local hospital and the preceding history of anemia, fever, weight loss, and fatigue. Uh, he was admitted through uh, A&E through the local hospital. Uh, his D-dimers were very elevated, and he underwent an urgent CT pulmonary angiogram, which showed pulmonary emboli, uh, and these big aneurysms, as you can see, highlighted by the yellow arrow. There were signs of pulmonary hypertension. He had a dilated pulmonary artery on the scans, uh, and his echo did uh, suggest pulmonary artery hypertension. So um, you can see some four, more images here. You can see these uh, large pulmonary artery aneurysms, and you can see the pulmonary emboli uh, in the background as well. So the diagnosis was not clear at all to the uh, acute physicians at the time. Um, and they anticoagulated, because of the PEs, not unexpectedly, they anticoagulated him uh, with daltaparin. Uh, but very shortly afterwards, he had a pretty brisk hemoptysis uh, with over a litre and a half of frank blood over a few days. Um, and he was transferred to the intensive care unit. So they gave him vitamin K, tranexamic acid, treated him with antibiotics, although there wasn't any obvious infection, uh, protamine and some red cells. So at this stage, uh, this is the usual Friday afternoon uh, phone call to the crews at, at uh, Guy's. David, we've got a really sick young man on the ITU here. Uh, would you be able to take him over? So we transferred him over to St. Thomas's to our ITU. Uh, uh, a bedside echo clearly showed pulmonary artery hypertension. His PA pressure was elevated at 53. Uh, lower limb Dopplers were negative, so there was no peripheral deep vein thrombosis. So we sat down with him and took a story. Uh, and he said that since the age of 10, he'd had recurrent mouth ulcers around his lips, the inner cheeks and his tongue. Um, he thought they might have been related to uh, eating or brushing his teeth. He'd not had any genital ulcers um, at, at, until that time. Okay. So um, he actually had a headache and um, he'd come to the Evelina at the age of 15 in 2012, where he was investigated by the pediatricians at the Evelina uh, and they found headaches and papilledema. Imaging showed this extensive uh, venous sinus thrombosis and he was treated with warfarin uh, for one year. So at this stage, the diagnosis was not clear. So um, when I saw him, he kind of consented to having clinical photographs. You can see the aptus ulceration and you can see these healed uh, papular pustular skin lesions uh, on his back. So uh, being rheumatologist, we did all the usual tests and absolutely everything came back negative. All his autoantibodies came back negative. Um, his HLA-B51 was also negative. 
Uh, his lupus anticoagulant was positive, but I wonder if this was a false positive given his very inflammatory picture. He didn't have any other features of antiphospholipid syndrome. So he underwent a cardiac MRI scan, which showed a right ventricular thrombus with myocardial infarction. Uh, and this is very characteristic, right ventricular thrombus in Bechet's. Uh, I've got two other two other patients who presented like this with a right ventricular thrombus as part of the, the Bechet's presentation. He had a moderate pericardial effusion, and the pulmonary artery aneurysms were noted uh, on the cardiac MRI scan, uh, as were the multiple pulmonary infarctions. So uh, we made a diagnosis of Bechet syndrome, just going back over the story, long-standing history of mouth ulcers, uh, papular pustular skin lesions, the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and now presenting with pulmonary artery aneurysms uh, with uh, th thrombotic events. So we treated him with immunosuppression. Uh, we gave him methylprednisolone, 500 milligrams, three doses, oral prednisolone. Uh, and given the severity of the disease, even though he's a young man, uh, we did offer him uh, sperm storage, but he declined. Uh, so we gave him the usual urolupus cyclophosphamide regimen, 500 milligrams every two weeks uh, for six doses. Now, there were some ups and downs. I've shortened this story quite a lot. He absconded from hospital and, and we had to ring him to persuade him to come back. But eventually he sort of settled down because he, he didn't agree. He didn't accept the diagnosis. But anyway, he eventually settled down um, and uh, he did well. The problem here was... He's got these big pulmonary artery aneurysms, uh, which could bleed. And indeed, one did bleed, uh, but it wasn't a heavy bleed. So the management dilemma here was to embolize or not to embolize these pulmonary artery aneurysms. Uh, and one of the downsides of embolization is, uh, and I've got another patient with bad bed shits with pulmonary artery aneurysms who did need embolization. And he had multiple pulmonary artery embolizations and ended up with pulmonary artery hypertension as a result of the multiple embolizations. So... With this young man, we decided not to embolize him unless the hemoptysis was life-threatening. Um, and he had no more hemoptysis, so he did not have pulmonary artery embolization. What about anticoagulation? Well, I think it's it's quite clear that he should not have been anticoagulation. We didn't know the diagnosis at the time, but you can see the result of the anticoagulation. He had a pretty brisk hemoptysis uh, on unfractionated heparin. And Turkish colleagues say you must not, absolutely not, anticoagulate uh, patients with Bechet's disease and pulmonary artery aneurysms, because if they bleed, uh, they could die. Uh, so anticoagulation is contraindicated in Bechet's disease with pulmonary artery aneurysms. The, 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 the con concept here is that the thrombosis, as Beverly said earlier, this is an inflammatory thrombosis uh, related to the Bechet syndrome. So we stopped the heparin, it was stopped before we came across. We started on aspirin and we carried on with the cyclophosphamide, uh, which he completed. Uh, and um, he he missed a few infusions because uh, for one reason or another, but he completed all six. We started him on methotrexate. He's actually done very well and he's still doing quite well uh, on long-term methotrexate. He's off his, his steroids. So this was some serial images. Uh, this was his first uh, CT pulmonary angiogram. You can see the large pulmonary artery aneurysm. It's inflammatory uh, lesion, uh, inflammatory mass around it. And this has considerably improved uh, on follow-up. That was a short follow-up, actually. And he's had no more thrombotic events. Uh, and he's actually been very well. So he has a full house uh, of Bechet's oral ulcers, although he didn't have genital ulcers, which is rather unusual. He had the skin lesions. He didn't have the ocular inflammation. He certainly had arthralgia. Uh, and um, the neurological lesions were due to the sagittal sinus thrombosis. Uh, he didn't have any gut lesions, but he certainly had the, the vascular lesions. And I think this chap illustrates the need for multidisciplinary team management because uh, this is a multi-system disease and you do need your colleagues uh, to help you with managing these patients. So the next patient is a slightly different approach, uh, but he's Cypriot, 28 years old, presented with recurrent fevers. And he also had a transverse sinus thrombosis with raised intracranial pressure. And he was treated before the diagnosis was made with warfarin and acetazolamide. That year, he presented with uh, hepatic vein thrombosis, Bud Chiari syndrome with ascites, uh, and he had thrombosis in the IVC in iliac veins, and he had hepatic vein stents, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Again, he had two positive lupus anticoagulant, and again, this is slightly confusing. I do wonder whether these were true positive lupus anticoagulants uh, or whether they were just false positives uh, because of the inflammatory picture. Both, both these patients had very high CRPs, and maybe Beverly can comment on that a little bit later on. So going through the story, he did have oral ulcers, uh, postular skin lesions, knee arthralgia, and erythema nodosum. Again, didn't have genital ulcers. They came a bit later, 
Again, he was HLA B51 negative. Here is his oral ulcers. You can see uh, aptus ulcers on his lower lip uh, and on his tongue, very painful ulcers on his tongue. And you can see the typical folliculitis and papular pustular skin lesions. Uh, and you can see the erythema nodosum. The photograph was taken after it had begun to improve uh, on treatment. So um, here is his imaging from his right hepatic vein thrombosis uh, and his occluded uh, left hepatic vein. Just bear with me, sorry. Um, oops, sorry. Can you still see the slides? You yes, can. we can. Yes. Uh, sorry, I've lost them. <laughs> oh. Just bear with me a minute. I've got them back. Here we are. So you can see the hepatic vein thrombosis and the occluded left hepatic veins, and you can see the clot in the IVC, and you can see the ascites. Um, so he had a stent put in, uh, which promptly clotted, uh, and he had to have a new stent put in. This is the, the, the new stent uh, that's been put in um, by the interventional radiologist. So we treated him with, uh, we did not anticoagulate him, we learned our lesson, uh, oral prednisolone, very small dose, and azathioprine. And he actually went into remission. He did not need cyclophosphamide. He's actually done very well uh, uh, on long-term treatment. So here's a, a very nice review on Bechet's disease and how to diagnose and treat vascular involvement by Sehahi uh, from Turkey. So vascular disease is more common and is more severe in males with Bechet's disease. Uh, as I've demonstrated, this is typically venous disease uh, with inflammatory thrombosis. Uh, the spectrum, uh, DVTs, IVC thrombosis, cerebral sinus thrombosis, these are the most common venous manifestations, uh, obviously also with pulmonary emboli. And pulmonary artery aneurysms are the most frequent arterial disease. Uh, and especially in Turkey, this is quite a, a reasonably common problem uh, in Turkey. I've got about two or three patients now, or three, three or four patients with pulmonary artery aneurysms. Uh, and these are quite scary patients to look after um, because they can bleed uh, and they can have uh, horrific consequences if the pulmonary artery aneurysms do bleed. Um, and the treatment is immunosuppression uh, and we try and avoid uh, embolization unless it's a torrential bleed. I've got one other patient who um, Beverly may remember. Uh, he had a torrential bleed and had to have his pulmonary artery, uh, his uh, uh, bronchial artery ligated to prevent him exsanguinating. So uh, the pathology of Bechet's is very different uh, from the usual thrombosis that we see in, for example, antiphospholipid syndrome. This is an inflammatory thrombus that's very adherent to the vessel wall, and it doesn't embolize. So I think this is quite a learning point um, for me, certainly, and others. So if you've got a, a, a Bechet's disease patient with a DVT, um, it's unlikely to embolize. It's unlikely to cause PE. Um, it, it is a prothrombic thrombotic state with Bechet's there's vascular damage. Um, so uh, any needling uh, of uh, the vessel or cannulation may trigger thrombosis. Uh, and the pathology is endothelial damage, not hypercoagulable, as it were. True vasculitis does occur, but it's actually very rare. And the arterial disease that I've mentioned is aneurysms. Uh, and these aneurysms are very distinct and different from the other large vessel vascular disease that we see. For example, Takayasu's um, uh, tachyasus can cause pulmonary artery vasculitis, but I've not seen pulmonary artery aneurysms uh, with tachyasus. So um, Bechet's disease, the main, uh, main causes of uh, morbidity in Bechet's disease are blindness from the untreated uh, ocular disease. Uh, and I think it's a good policy for Bechet's disease patients to be referred to the ophthalmologist because they can have sometimes uh, asymptomatic ocular disease um, and it's worth asking the ophthalmologist just to review them. Physical disability from the uh, arthritis uh, and cognitive dysfunction is quite common. Leading causes of death, as I've mentioned here, pulmonary artery aneurysms uh, and Bud Chiari syndrome. And I've shown you uh, examples of both these uh, complications. So in terms of treatment, this is a little very nice summary from Hassan Yazici's uh, review. Uh, we've got... Uh, looking at the organs across the top here and treatment. So cutaneous lesions, uh, topical corticosteroids. Uh, colchicine, I think, is the bedrock of the management of uh, Bechet's disease. Colchicine is very useful in terms of treating oral and genital ulceration and the joint symptoms. Um, 
I've never used lactobacilli lozenges, but it's on the summary here. Azathioprine is very commonly used, um, both in the Middle East and, and by ourselves. Uh, and um, if that fails, then you can use biologic agents. So interferon uh, and uh, anti-TNF therapies, uh, etanercept can be used. Epremolast uh, has recently been used, uh, licensed in fact, approved for use in, in Bechet's disease when all the above uh, medications are, are not working. At least in this country, in order to get approval for the biologic agents, interferon or in, in, in anti-TNF therapies, you do need to refer these patients to the National uh, Betches Disease Centres of Excellence. There's one in, in London at the Royal London Hospital in the Dental Institute. And there's others in, in Birmingham and Liverpool. For more serious others, other manifestations, uveitis and venous thrombosis, azathioprine, biologic agents, uh, or adalidumab. Uh, these are all on the slide. Uh, pulmonary artery aneurysms, cyclophosphamide, as illustrated by the young man I, I treated, uh, followed by azathioprine. Uh, uh, infliximab uh, can also be used as maintenance for these patients with pulmonary artery aneurysms and peripheral aneurysms. So I've certainly seen other aneurysms elsewhere. I've got a, a young man with a femoral artery aneurysm that has responded to immunosuppression. CNS involvement uh, can occur. Neurobetchets is very serious. Um, I've never seen very serious neurobetchets. Uh, they tend to be seen by the Betchett's Disease Centre of Excellence. Uh, Desmond Kidd is the neurologist who works at the Royal Free and also at the Betchett's Disease Clinic, who is very skilled at managing neuro Betchett's. And these treat these patients do need intensive treatment. And then gut involvement is usually the 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 uh, ulceration uh, aspect. There are recommendations, uh, ULR uh, recommendations for the management of of, of Betchett's, which is worth a read if you're interested. Uh, so in summary, in my last slide, uh, so this is a very fascinating condition. It's very rare in this country, uh, but it's definitely worth uh, diagnosing and worth not missing because consequences are serious if you miss it. It's a very clinical diagnosis, so you have to you have your wits about it and have some awareness uh, about Betchett's. Uh, the geoepidemiology is interesting in terms of the Silk Road. Uh, treatment is stratified according to the organ involvement, and you definitely do need uh, uh, multidisciplinary care for these patients. Prognosis tends to be worse in young males, uh, and the prognosis uh, is worse with these factors, ocular involvement, vascular involvement, neurobetchets, and severe gut disease. Uh, but generally, the good news is that if you treat the patients and they respond, the disease often abates over time, uh, and you can come off most medications. So uh, these are all uh, my colleagues uh, uh, who've helped me with these difficult patients. So uh, time for quite plenty of time for questions. So thank you again for uh, the invitation, Beverly. Well, thank you, David. That's fantastic. And um, you really have shown us some powerful cases that illustrate the type of problems that you can have with thrombosis and breches. Um, I'd like to open the discussion. Does anybody have anything to say? Uh, whilst we're waiting for questions, I think that I, I have to emphasize that we tend to have large vessel thrombosis with Bechet's, don't we, David? Mm -hmm. yes, because indeed. we're talking cerebral sinus thrombosis mm -hmm. or blood Chiari, or quite often we might see inferior vena cava thrombosis, a large mm -hmm. proximal DVT. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is our intervention radiologists and radiologists are always looking for thickening of the vessel wall mm -hmm. uh, in those who they think might have Bechet's. That, that's been a clue over the last few years. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing about the uh, lupus anticoagulant and the positive and the high CRP is that we know that if you have very high CRP, you will get a false positive lupus mm -hmm. anticoagulant. Mm -hmm. And it came to prominence in COVID-19 pneumonia, where even the New England Journal uh, didn't seem to realize that mm -hmm. patients with lupus anticoagulant, uh, well, people with um, uh, COVID with their high CRPs would have a positive lupus anticoagulant. And there are two letters about it uh, before someone pointed out that you would expect that with a high CRP. Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite an important point, Beverly, because both the patients I described both had a positive lupus anticoagulant, but they were negative for cardiolipin and beta-2 GP1 antibodies. So I'm pretty sure they were false positive results because of the CRP. So that was a definite learning point for me. 
And, and the other point you make about not treating <laughs> their pulmonary thrombosis when they've got pulmonary aneurysms is mm. just an amazing fact mm -hmm. for people practicing in hematology because they, they see thrombosis on a CTPA and feel obligated to treat mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And we have to think again if mm -hmm. people have got pulmonary aneurysms and, and go and look for a history mm -hmm. of uh, Bechet's is really what you're saying, isn't mm -hmm. it? So I think that was illustrated very nicely by the first case. So uh, when you sat down with him and just talked to him, the story emerged, long history of uh, ulceration and skin lesions and things. So the, the diagnosis, as always, is in the history. <laughs> OK, um, there don't seem to be any questions. Please do feel free to ask. You do have a world expert here. No, it looks like you did a, a perfect performance. <laughs> right, okay. There, there is no. one question. Oh, one question coming oh, up. Lovely. I oh, can't yeah. See it. Do patients yeah. need. Oh, I've got it. Yeah. So, question. I'll read it out. Do patients need long term VTE prophylaxis if they presented with thrombotic events? I think not, actually. Uh, Beverly can help me answer this one. But uh, because these thrombotic events are inflammatory, the key aspect is getting them under control with immunosuppression. Uh, colchicine is helpful, but especially these patients, uh, as as I showed with large vessel uh, involvement, they do need immunosuppression. And provide you, providing you immunosuppress them and get the disease under control with immunosuppression, you don't need long-term um, heparin or aspirin uh, at all. And I don't think NOACs have a place for this, uh, in this disease anyway. And warfarin neither? Not warfarin either. No. <laughs> Definitely not no. warfarin. <laughs> Definitely not warfarin. As the as the Turkish experience have showed, if you warfarinize young men with pulmonary artery aneurysms and they bleed, they usually die. So warfarin is an absolute contraindication to Bechet's disease with pulmonary artery aneurysms. And I think that's a very strong message from all the literature. So the the DOAX with anti ten A activity actually have a mild anti inflammatory effect. Oh right, but right. We, yes, mm. but I mm. think they're probably not worthy. Yes, uh, when we have <laughs> an aneurysm <laughs> yeah. waiting to explode. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, David, oh, it's, there's no more questions. I think. Let me just check. Nope, we've answered the question in the chat. So thank you so much for such a perfect lecture. Great. Okay. Uh, Thank you all afternoon. for the invitation and I hope the rest of the meeting goes well. Today. Yeah. I've got another Thank meeting. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Great. Very Thanks very much indeed. Bye. So we've talked now about thrombosis in normal vessels due to inflammation. Now we're moving on to talk about abnormal vessels, uh, abnormal vascular beds where you have got changes in flow such there are shear stresses that cause activation of coagulation and platelets and the best example of that is clippel trelawney syndrome and i'm really delighted to welcome professor saha mansell who comes to us from the department of clinical genetics at st george's uh, she's a consultant in clinical genetics. Her specialist interests include primary lymphedema, dysmorphia, skeletal dysplasia, prenatal diagnosis, and the genetics of hematological disorders. Uh, and she is very closely linked with the network uh, that help patients with clippel trelawney. And she's going to tell us that actually we should stop using clippel trelawney. Uh, as a name pretty soon. Okay, thank you very much, Saha. I'm handing the button to you. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my slides? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I work at St. George's Hospital, where we have a national clinic for lymphovascular disorders. So we uh, have been learning a huge amount about a spectrum of disorders that includes clippel trenorni syndrome. So I'm going to focus on this particular condition, but it does have huge overlap with some of the other lymphovascular disorders. My only disclosure is that I'm not a hematologist, so forgive me if I get the terms wrong about the thromboses or treatments because I'm not familiar with them. 
So like Bechet's, this is an ancient condition. In fact, it's older than Bechet's. Uh, it was first described in, the, in 1900 by two French physicians called Klippel and Trenorni. And they described two patients uh, presenting with a port wine stain, uh, venous varicosities, and uh, segmental overgrowth of, of the, that affected limb. Um, and they called it nevus vasculosus osteohypertrophicus. I can't speak, I can't pronounce it properly, but um, so that was the first uh, time that this had been described. And then a few years later in 1907, uh, a clinician called uh, Parks Weber describes another patient with very similar findings, but in addition had a high flow, a large high flow arteriovenous malformation. Um, and he called it hemangiectatic hypertrophy. Um, the ISFA is the International Vascular Anomalies um, group who have been working really hard on classifying these vascular malformations. And as you can see, uh, the last one was 2018, and I think it's due for an update because things have moved on even since then. They described simple combined and the clippal trenorni fits into the associated with other anomalies. So these are syndromes in which vascular malformations are complicated by other problems. So even in this classification, they are still using the term clippal trenorni syndrome, but there has been a more recent move to move away from it because it can be caused by a number of different genes and the management can be different depending on those genes, which I'm going to cover in this talk. But for now, I think it's okay to use the term. We find it incredibly helpful to use the term, so we still use it too. And you can see Parks Weber is here too. But from this 2018 classification, they've only got one gene for Klippel Trenorni and one gene for Parks Weber that's already uh, evolved. So what is Klippel Trenorni syndrome? It's actually really hard to find a clear definition. It's estimated that at least one in 100,000 people worldwide have this condition. There doesn't seem to be any areas where it's high, there is a higher incidence. And um, looking at the literature and from my own experience, I would say that Klippel Trenorni involves one hind quarter or one forequarter and they must have a vascular malformation, which can include any of these four vascular malformations that I will explain in detail. Plus, they must have disturbed growth. So in most cases, there is segmental overgrowth of the affected limb with bones and soft tissue. And in a few cases, that limb is actually smaller than the unaffected limb. So disturbed growth can be overgrowth, hypertrophy or hypotrophy, um, it both can be uh, present. Parks Weber syndrome is now considered to be a separate entity. They have exactly the same findings as Klippel Trenorni, but they have the presence of a high flow arteriovenous malformation. So if you see a high flow arteriovenous malformation, then it's Parks Weber. You are allowed uh, smaller uh, AVMs in Klippel Trenorni, but if, uh, if the main cause of the problem is a high flow arteriovenous malformation, the term Parks Weber syndrome is used. So, vascular malformations covers a huge range of problems. There is the capillary malformation, which may be, uh, as this patient presents, with an extensive port wine stain. Um, and this is due to extended capillary vessels and the superficial dermis of the skin. You can see the very uh, dark uh, reddish purple discoloration, usually present from birth, may vary a little bit uh, according to weather, but is, is very prominent and easy to identify. So this is a capillary malformation. You can also have a, a much lighter capillary malformation, which I'll show you later. Or they may have venous malformations. These may involve aberrant uh, venous anatomy with persistent uh, 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 embryonal veins. They may be mega veins, tortuous veins, or varicose veins with uh, incompetence. And if they have a venous component, they often present with pain, swelling, and they may have uh, thromboembolic events or consumptive coagul 
coagulopathy. Um, my experience, our experience, is that distended veins or veins that are getting recurrent thromboses are painful. And I'm sure you're aware of that. But once, because the clinic co covers lymphedema and lymphedema is very rarely painful. So if a patient's complaining of a lot of pain, we always consider that there is a venous malformation as well as a lymphatic malformation. So this is one of our patients with clippal trinorne. This is what we call a lymphocentigraphy. Uh, we inject radioactive isotope in the uh, toe web spaces at the bottom here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, and on the uh, left leg here, because this is from the posterior view, you can see that the, uh, the, the radioactive isotope is going up the leg and refluxing back down or rerouting. So you can see an outline of the leg on the left, which is abnormal, whereas on the right, it's a fairly normal lymphocentigraphy. So there is definitely poor lymphatic drainage in some of these patients. The other lymphatic malformation that you may see are lymphangiectatic blisters, which I'll show you in a minute too. If you have a lymphatic malformation in isolation, you rarely get pain, but you do get swelling. You have a high risk of recurrent cellulitis and you may get leakage from these lymphangiectatic blisters, which may be pure lymph or blood-stained lymph. The disturbed growth is not just in girth, it's not edema, it has to be bone, muscle or fat. This lady has a much larger right leg because of fat hypertrophy. There is more fat in that leg and it's part of the condition. Uh, very rarely you get a smaller leg. The problems with the disturbed growth is that there is often limb length discrepancy causing scoliosis and therefore joint pains, um, both in the hips and back. So I'm going to, like the last speakers, just give you three examples, uh, four I think, examples of patients we've seen with clippal trinorne syndrome and talk about the causes of their clippal trinorne syndrome and the problems caused by the condition. So um, just a little reminder that a genetics, genetic conditions may occur as a germline or gonadal um, abnormality. So uh, it's in the egg or the sperm and every cell in the fetus is affected. So the whole baby is uh, affected and this can be passed from one generation to another. So this is a germline mutation causing a genetic disorder. In clippal trinorne, however, quite often there is a mosaic abnormality, which means that the mutation has occurred after conception, which is post-zygotically. So one cell has developed a mutation and all the daughter cells, the cells that have proliferated from that one cell are also affected. And therefore any area of the body that has originated from that uh, mutated cell can be affected. So you see a mosaic abnormality as you'd see in the Roman mosaics with different colors, but also in the tortoise shell cat because of um, X inactivation, they have a, a mosaic appearance. If you cloned this cat, you'd get different coloring because of random X inactivation. So mosaic means patchy, uh, and, cover, and occurs after conception. So this lady is a 38-year-old teacher. She presented with a lymphovenovascular malformation of the right hind quarter. She, her right leg was longer than her left, and therefore she had had an epiphyseal fusion at the age of 13 years, but she still had two centimeter limb length discrepancy. Her right leg was longer. Um, other investigations had shown that she also had splenic and hepatic hemangiomas. And what you can see here is fat hypertrophy of the right buttock. And you can see these lymphangiectatic blisters. They uh, look bloodstained. But the key thing with this condition is that quite often the capillaries, the veins and the lymphatics are poorly differentiated and may be confused and may show features of both lymphatic and capillary abnormalities. So she complained of a lot of pain. She's on a number of different painkillers, partly because of these lesions, but partly because of uh, probably venous involvement. She has leakage from lesions, which are usually bloodstained. She has a scoliosis because of limb length discrepancy. 
and she has swelling of the right foot causing and, and, and resulting in recurrent cellulitis. We uh, quite often do a baseline D-dimer, um, which I'll explain why towards the end of this talk. Her baseline D-dimer was 645, which is not astronomically high, but it is higher than the normal range, which suggests to us that she has venous malformations also. So in these patients, the best way forward in trying to make a diagnosis is to take a skin biopsy from the affected skin. If you take blood or if you take skin from an unaffected area, you are unlikely to find the genetic cause. And the genetic cause now is leading to more and more targeted treatment. So it's becoming increasingly important to make a specific diagnosis. So we did a biopsy from her right leg and we sent it to the lab at guys who identified that she has a mutation in a gene called PIK3CA, which is the most common cause of Klippel-Trenorny syndrome. She has a common mutation that's been seen hundreds of times before, and it's only in 4% of the cells that we sent. And we sent cells from a lymphangiectatic blister. So it's only in 4% and it's causing all this trouble. The PIK3CA pathway, the AKT pathway, is a very well-known pathway. It is important for um, cell proliferation, and it was first discovered in association with cancer. So mutations in most of these genes can result, if, they, if they're acquired later in life, results in cancer. But if you get them at an embryological stage in the embryo or the fetus, you get a developmental disorder such as klippel trenorny So this is the AKT pathway um, and PIK3CA is the most common genetic cause of disturbance in this pathway. And this is quite an old paper now, 2007, showing you that in breast cancer, uh, about uh, 80, what, well, it's 40% of uh, breast cancer sorry, 40% of cancers had the exact same mutation. So if you acquire this later in adulthood, you can get breast, colon, other cancers. It can result as a driver mutation. It can be the driver mutation for cancers. And these are all gain of function mutations. So they cause excessive cell proliferation with uh, poor differentiation. So PIK3CA, you can see our lady here under the klippel trenorny section. This is a huge spectrum of disorders. So you can have just macrodactyly, just one finger that's very, very large. You can see the normal fingers here, the little finger and the ring finger, but macrodactyly here, it's the same mutation. This lady is very well known. She has massive uh, segmental overgrowth of her left leg resulting in amputation. This is one of our patients here again with segmental overgrowth, vascular malformations, venous malformations, lots and lots of problems. This is a condition called cloves, uh, where they get lipomatous overgrowth, vascular malformations, epidermal nevi and spinal abnormalities. And then you, if, it's, if it occur, mutation occurs in the head, you can get megalencephaly, macrocephaly with vascular malformations and with quite severe intellectual disability and seizures. So it depends where, which tissue, where, where is the mutation, which tissue is affected, what percentage of the cells are affected, when did it occur during embryogenesis or in the fetus, and the type of mutation. So this is a hugely variable condition. Anything that's mosaic is hugely variable because it depends on these four different factors. Um, and the reason it's important to make this diagnosis is, is that for some years now, we have been able to repress the function of this gene by giving mTOR inhibitors, uh, which down-regulate the uh, cell proliferation, such as sirolimus, everolimus, um, tacrolimus, we usually use serolimus. Um, this of course is an immunosuppressant, so it has problems. Um, in a review of the use of serolimus uh, in these patients, they looked at 20 studies involving 71 patients. There was partial remission in 85% 
a, a few of them had progressive disease. So you don't see a dramatic response, you see a gradual response. And if it just stops the progression of the disease, the patients are usually quite um, happy with that, not happy, but um, yeah, satisfied. The common side effects, our most common side effect is recurrent infection. So a woman is like this case where she's getting recurrent cellulitis, we're really um, reluctant to start serolimus because of the risk of increasing the risk of, of cellulitis. They can also get hyperlipidemia, but that's treatable. So she's actually been enrolled in a new, relatively new study called EPIC phase two, which is run by Novartis. And this is looking at a new drug called alpelacib, which actually is a specific targeted treatment for blocking PIK3CA directly. It's not blocking further down the pathway, it's actually blocking PIK3CA. This drug was uh, in De December 2022 was approved for the use of breast cancer driven by PIK3CA. So it's a chemotherapy drug, which we're now using for patients with pic 3 3CA related overgrowth spectrum disorder, PROS, which includes clipyltrenorni in some cases. So knowing the genetic basis has helped us choose the right drugs. So she's just started in this trial. Um, so we haven't got any outcome measures yet. Uh, she's literally, and she may possibly be on placebo. A third of the patients are initially on placebo. Um, and this drug was uh, looked at by a plastic surgeon in France. I don't know if he's on the call, um, but he used it, it palliatively in 19 patients with PIK3CA related overgrowth spectrum disorders and had quite uh, moderate to dramatic results. Um, and therefore they've started a, a, a proper drug trial for, for, this, for this drug. So for some time, if you look at the ISFA classification, it was thought that all clipyltrenorni was due to pic 3 ca but it's becoming clear that you can get the same or very similar presentation with dif different genes. So this is a 35-year-old gentleman. He again has segmental overgrowth of the left leg. He had epiphyseal fusion in his uh, teens to stop the growth of that uh, leg, it still is longer. You can see it's very swollen. He has lymphedema in that um, in that leg. He has varicose veins, which you can see clearly, and you can't see very clearly, but he has a vascular malformation. Uh, maybe you can see it at the bottom here, some birth, uh, some skin changes uh, consistent with a vascular malformation. And when you do a venous duplex on that left leg, you see there are tortuous uh, lymphatics and incompetent, uh, sorry, veins, tortuous veins and incompetent veins. So the veins are abnormal in that leg as well as the other problems he has. So his problems include left leg uh, lymphedema. He, his was the lymphocentigraphy I showed you earlier. He has recurrent cellulitis because of the edema. He has the pain in the left hip, which may be related to the limb length discrepancy. He has these bony lesions, which you sometimes see in this with this particular gene that I'm going to reveal in a minute. He's had recurrent superficial vein thromboses and his baseline D-dimer, like the previous lady, is raised at 740, as showing he has venous malformations, which you can see clinically anyway. So we again did a biopsy from his affected leg, and this time, instead of PIK3CA, we found that he had a mutation in a different gene called KRAS. And this is a very common pathogenic variant. We've seen it several times, and it was only in 2% of the cells. Again, you need a very low dose to cause a lot of problems. So this is another path pathway, the RASMAP kinase pathway, this is the PIK3CA AKT pathway that I showed you before on the left. On the right is the RASMAP kinase pathway. Both of them are important for control of cell proliferation. So this is another cell proliferation pathway. And if you have a germline mutation in KRAS or any of the genes in this pathway, you get a different condition called Noonan syndrome or cardiofacio-cutaneous syndrome. So they have very 
different problems. So if you have a germline mutation, which means it's in all the cells, you have this sort of problem. But if you have a mosaic postzygotic mutation, you get a clipotrinone like or, or spectrum of disorders. Just like PIK3CA, uh, KRAS also is common as a driver mutation. In fact, it's the exact same uh, mutation in many cancers here, pancreatic cancer, um, up to uh, nearly 90%, it's a driver mutation, colon cancer, several cancers, KRAS is implicated as the driver mutation, and it's the very same mutation as the one seen in our gentleman. Oh, sorry, wrong way. So <clears throat> finally, our case three, this lady has very clear port wine stains, capillary malformations of the right hind quarter. She's got segmental overgrowth of the right leg with fat hypertrophy that you can see. The skin changes were present at birth, but she developed lymphedema or swelling in her 30s. So if you saw her in clinic, I had money on her having a PIK3CA mutation. All the uh, medical literature would tell you it's PIK3CA. It's entirely consistent, but I've stopped guessing because um, it was wrong. Um, so she was getting pain in her right leg. There was a limb length discrepancy. She was getting le uh, bleeding from these telangiectatic uh, lesions and she had swelling. And the skin biopsy this time showed a mutation in a different gene called GNAQ. And this gene has classically been associated with Sturge-Faber syndrome, so port wine stain, glaucoma, and uh, cerebral hemangiomas. Um, so there's not much written about it causing clipotrinone, but uh, we're, we are seeing it. We've, I think we've got two or three patients with mutations in this gene causing a clipotrinone phenotype. And again, look, 4% of her cells were affected. Very, very low level is enough to cause problems. And this gene is up here and therefore stimulates the RASMAP kinase pathway. So it's again a causing cell proliferation. <clears throat> Finally, the last case I want to tell you about is a case of Parkes Weber syndrome, because sometimes the genetics of Parkes Weber is different. And in this case, this was a germline mutation. Uh, which means it was present in the egg or the sperm prior to conception. And this is a condition called capillary malformation, AVM type 1. And this is uh, or also uh, Parkes Weber syndrome. And this is due to a gene called RASA1. So this is a constitutional germline mutation causing what looks like a mosaic pattern. And it may present like clipotrinone. And in these cases, you have a pale pinkish red capillary malformation. Often, I don't know if you can see here around the, the capillary malformation, there is a halo. It's a lighter color where there's sort of blood steel um, into these uh, the vascular malformations. So these halo capillary malformations, you can see a more extensive one on her left leg here. And... Uh, it's an autosomal dominant condition. So you may see capillary malformations in one patient and you may see um, a, 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 this sort of patient where he has a capillary malformation uh, in the inner left thigh. He has varicosities, extensive varicosities. This leg is much hotter. The left leg is hotter than the right. I always listen for a brewery. I have to say, I rarely hear a brewery, but they say to listen because he has a high flow AVM resulting in segmental overgrowth and he has an association of vascular malformation. So this is Parkes Weber syndrome. It's considered to be a separate entity to clipotrinone, but may present in a similar way. So finally, just talking about the management, um, it depends on which parts are manifesting. So if they have a capillary or lymphatic malformation, you may consider compression garments. These are really helpful both for venous malformations, but also for lymphatic, uh, impaired lymphatic drainage. They, a lot of people get relief, uh, not just in reduction in swelling, but also a reduction in pain if there's pain related to distended veins. Skin care is essential to prevent recurrent cellulitis. If they do get recurrent cellulitis, we start them on a low dose uh, penicillin V prophylaxis. 
Um, they some would want laser therapy because of the cosmetic appearance of the capillary malformation, and others who have leakage, like our first case, may benefit from sclerotherapy, as she did. The disturbed growth, if it's not too dramatic, you may uh, just uh, use orthopedic devices such as shoe inserts. Um, and epiphyseal fusion at puberty is often um, used as well. It's quite hard to time it so that you stop the growth of the one leg so that the other leg catches up. So it's a critical time timing that the orthopedic surgeons are getting better at. If there are venous malformations, again, compression garments can help. Vascular surgeons may help with laser or ablation of veins, embolization or surgery. Um, and uh, there may be a role for anticoagulation, which I'll talk about in a little more detail. So I had a look about, because you're a thrombotic <laughs> audience, I had a look about um, thrombosis, the risk of thrombosis in these patients and the role of anticoagulations. There are no current clear guidelines. There is a European reference network looking at vascular anomalies and uh, I've been involved in the lymphedema one. We've had long discussions about the best form of management at the moment. Each center is using their own uh, rough guidelines. So there doesn't seem to be clear guidelines for these patients. I, if you know better than me, I'd be really grateful to hear about it. Um, there's also very few studies. I found this study from 2022 last year, which I thought was very good, uh, but there is so little written about the risk of thromboembolic events in these patients. So this is a Dutch study. They looked at 173 of their own patients, plus they did a literature review, and they showed that nearly 40% had a thromboembolic event, but some of these were superficial venous thromboses, but about 6% had a pulmonary embolus and the mean age of these events was 28. Um, the events were characterized by elevated D-dimers, but as you saw from my, our, our patients, the D-dimers are nearly always high, even when they're not having a thrombotic event. So it's not always helpful, although we have found that if you see a dramatic rise in the D-dimers, that can help you inform you as to whether they're having a thrombotic event. And in severe cases, I think Beverly had one recently, there was uh, bleeding and a consumptive coagulopathy. So, but despite this relatively high risk of thromboembolic events, there's no standard prophylactic treatment. And certainly we do not use prophylaxis for our patients, maybe we should. Um, so they had 29 patients, which was nearly 17% on anticoagulant therapy because of these events. And they used a, a variety of different anticoagulants, including direct oral uh, anticoagulants in a, nearly 50% of the patients that were on anticoagulants. So there's no, not even, I believe, any standard approach to these thromboembolic events. How, how long should we use them for? Which ones should we use? And finally, there was a nice paper, it's, although it's quite old now, 20, 2009, by Mika Vickler and Lawrence Boone in Belgium, who see a lot of these patients. And they found that the elevated D-dimers are highly specific for venous malformations. And that's quite helpful for us if we see a patient with clippal trinorni and they are complaining of pain and we do the D-dimers, they're elevated. It suggests that they have venous malformations. So we would then go on to do further uh, in, um, investigations um, and it so a high D-dimer in these patients does not mean that they're currently having a serious thromboembolic event. I think they're persistently high. So the final thing that I have touched on and I just wanted to highlight again is that the, the, this is a genetically heterogeneous group, many different causes and I as a clinical geneticist, I would say this, but I think it's worth trying to get to the bottom of it because there are these new oral treatments, medical treatments that can at least dampen down the progressive nature of these conditions. So uh, serolimus is widely used now um, and does have a mild to moderate benefit. 
There is new targeted treatment for PIK3CA with alpelisib, and we should get the results of the trial in the next year or so. And if you have a patient with a KRAS mutation and possibly a GNAQ mutation, maybe there may be a role for using MEK inhibitors such as trametinib um, or other chemotherapy agents. So um, I think that the genetics is starting to inform the management, which is a new area for us. We've never really treated anything before, but it's quite an exciting area. And finally, um, these two pathways work together. They have a negative feedback. So um, if you suppress one pathway, sometimes you get an increase in the, you get an upregulation of the other pathway. So people are now starting to look at combined therapies, maybe trying to suppress both pathways. So it is an evolving, rapidly evolving area. So in summary, in my opinion, Lipple-Trinorni syndrome is a useful term and it involves one quarter, hind or four quarter, that they have to have a vascular malformation and disturbed growth of that quarter. It is usually a somatic postzygotic mutation, but it's not always not always pick three CA. But you do need to think about germline, particularly if you have a high flow AVM. And these mutations are always gain of function. They activate key cell proliferative pathways, the same pathways involved in cancer. They have extremely variable presentation depending on which tissue is affected, the timing of the mutation in, in the embryo, the dose of the mutation, and also the um, type of mutation. I think, from my experience, it's really difficult to guess the underlying gene. <laughs> I've got it wrong so often. Um, so it's well worth doing the test. And be, that, the reason for that is targeted treatment will be dependent on the underlying genetic cause, and we will understand these conditions further if we know why they are happening. And just like the last, uh, Professor de Cruz, the, you must have a multidisciplinary team approach for these patients who are really complex and have a huge number of problems. So in our clinic, we've got genetics, we have dermatology, and we do have plastic surgery and interventional radiologist. Um, we could do with a haematologist. Um, so thank you very much. Oh, and the treatment with anticoagulation is not yet clear. There's so little evidence at the moment. That's our team. Um, and thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much, Saha. You have really covered KT very comprehensively. We don't have any time left, I'm afraid, for questions, which I can't see any in. That's probably because you explained it so well. I have to say I've got about half a dozen on long-term anticoagulation because they have had recurrent thrombosis, uh, usually DVT or higher than that, even in IVC. So um, I think that there is a role and we tend to use DOEX in those patients. Um, and I have taken the messaging about, let's find out why they have KT, what is their genetic abnormality, because then we could send them on maybe to you for some therapy to control their disease. So thank you very much. Amazing. Maybe we'll be sending some to you as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sounds thank good. Uh, so thank you very much. And I'm going to move on to our last uh, talk. And we're moving on to Kleinfelter's syndrome. And I think that we probably have a number of patients with Kleinfelter's in our clinics, in the thrombosis teams, but we aren't really picking them up. Uh, and I would like to welcome Mr. Tet Yap. He is actually in Malaysia. Uh, although he works at Guy's and St. Thomas's, he's at another conference. Los Angeles. Where... Oh, sorry, Los Angeles. I'm so sorry. So what time is it? What time is um, it? It's just past seven. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for coming in. But he's actually based at um, Guy's and St. Thomas's. He's a reader in urology and at, at King's College Hospital. And he's a consultant andrological surgeon. Uh, and he really spearheads our regional andrological and male infertility services uh, at Guy's and St. Thomas's. 
and he's got the first in the world multidisciplinary clinic specifically dedicated to Kleinfelter's syndrome. So we couldn't have asked a better person. Over to you, Tet, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I'm just going to share my slides. Um, can you see my slides? No, we can't. Okay. Are you using Chrome? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think you need to go to presenter mode. Uh, how do we do that? Sorry. Mm. Um, usually at the a slide go to slideshow slideshow mm -hmm. and then share your screen again um, we're not yes perfect can you see that Conflict okay. of interest disclosures up at the moment. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Perfect. You can see that now. Well, it's rather small. If you can go to slideshow, because we can see down the side, you have the slide. Perfect. Lovely. Yeah. Over to you. Okay. Wonderful. Sorry about that. Um, so thank you for the amazing introduction. Uh, I'm uh, Ted. I um, am a urologist at Guys and St. Thomas's, and um, I uh, help lead our a team uh, of um, uh, various specialties at the Kleinfeld Multidisciplinary Clinic in St. Thomas's. And um, I was uh, previously the chair of the ERN for genetic male infertility as well. So I have no conflicts of interest. Um, and I guess most of you would have been exposed to Kleinfeld because it's not actually that rare compared to all the other genetic issues we've discussed uh, this, uh, this evening or this afternoon. Um, uh, Kleinfeld is really for, uh, it's a group of chromosomal disorders uh, where there's an, one extra X chromosome compared to um, the 46XY male karyotype. So 90% just have one extra X chromosome, that's 47XXY. And we think that this is due to uh, non disjunction um, uh, during gametogenesis of the sperm or the ova um, in, in the meiotic uh, phase. Um, and you can have maternal or paternal non-disjunction uh, equally in KS. The, the remaining 10% are either higher uh, grades of uh, this. So XXY, XXXY, and then you get X, it just, it can go on, um, or a mosaic of 46XY, 47XXY. So mosaic gland fault is, is um, thought to be due to the um, post-fertilization mitotic non-disjunction during fetal development. And classically, they have a um, less severe phenotype uh, than the um, non-mosaics. You do uh, often see in textbooks, and sometimes you see in clinic, the, the typical Kleinfelter's uh, patient, but uh, more often than not, um, as uh, we get to grips with uh, Kleinfelter's and with our clinic, uh, this is not the case, but this is what typically um, the textbooks say you have taller than average men, uh, reduced facial hair, reduced body hair, and these signs of hypogonadism with a gynecomastia, a truncal fat distribution, and um, a history of osteoporosis. The, the key similarity with all the patients is actually small testis or testicular atrophy. And we see that across the board, um, probably the, the best diagnostic um, feature. But as I said before, prevalence is about 1 to 2.5 um, uh, uh, per 1,000. So not, not really that uh, rare. But the problem is only 25 to 50% get diagnosed in their lifetimes. So we know this through autopsy studies, through biobank studies. Uh, this, this has been pretty consistent. Um, we find, and a lot of uh, clinicians find, that um, you pick up client filters while investigating male infertility. And that's actually 70% of all referrals to, to a clinic 
um, they, they got diagnosed through the fertility pathway. But it's also the most common genetic cause of primary hypogonadism, so low testosterone, high FSH and LH. So initially, and, uh, and still to this date, treatment really centered around fertility, testosterone correction, um, if they have symptoms. But actually, um, these patients have a lot more than just azospermia and hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. They have lots of neurocognitive issues, psychosocial manifestations, cardiovascular, metabolic, bone-related issues. Fascinating because we still don't know why. Uh, we think some of them might relate it to um, uh, the exposure to testosterone at a very young age. Um, our pediatric team, has, we have a pediatric clinic as well, are looking at um, uh, doing some fMRI studies, for example, to look uh, deeper into the neurocognitive issues um, uh, with and without testosterone uh, supplementation. This is in collaboration with our colleagues here in the US. But what we uh, then understood from uh, our exposure to Kleinfelter's patients that they really required a more holistic management approach. A lot of them have tons of issues beyond just fertility and low testosterone. So um, uh, a, a few patients uh, were the inspiration for this, but we then set up the multidisciplinary clinic at St. Thomas's, um, the first apparently in, in the world, um, uh, certainly the first in the UK, um, that included not just the urology um, side of things for the fertility, and the gentle aspects, but also as they were referring to the female pathway uh, for fertility, we needed someone for their partners. So we had to get a gynecologist in um, to explain what IVF was and, and what the process of sperm retrieval in azospermia is and so on. And then we had to have the endocrine team um, uh, in the clinic as well, because uh, if you're on testosterone supplementation, um, uh, you, you are azospermic anyway. So we needed to change um, uh, the, uh, the, the treatment of um, these patients to a fertility um, uh, testosterone supplementation pathway using FSH and LH stimulation, for example. Uh, so totally different from just testosterone gels. Um, we needed a plastic surgeon uh, to help with um, gy gynecomastic issues. And uh, it was the most difficult was to get the uh, psychosexual, psychological, uh, and psychiatrical um, uh, inputs from from different uh, uh, units because uh, we couldn't supply it from just our units. We had to reach out to, uh, uh, for example, the Tavistock Adult um, Department, and this is um, really interesting because um, prior to setting up the clinic, we didn't realize how much gender issues had come to be a part of uh, client falters. But um, one of the reasons why I'm here is uh, we've just presented at um, the American conferences uh, where our team have looked into uh, client falters in the UK. Only 55%, for example, identify purely as a cis male. So um, uh, there, there are lots of issues um, underlying um, client falters in terms of gender psychiatry, but also a lot uh, with neurodisability, executive function, and so on. So um, our latest link is with the National Autism Service, who now come to the clinic, um, because eight, about 80% of our patients have ADHD and autism, um, most of them undiagnosed, but um, uh, are totally symptomatic for this. Uh, beyond this, we have um, an expert pharmacist, because you can imagine all the different medications um, that uh, you're on with client falters, and some of them are injections, for example, during the fertility period, you do need a pharmacist dedicated to um, uh, you know, the prescriptions and to the teaching how to administer these things. And we have an expert radiologist, because we're doing a series now on indeterminate lesions um, uh, in the testis, but also... Um, uh, for the breast, because it's a much higher risk of breast cancer uh, in uh, Kleinfeld's men. Um, beyond all this, um, it was really important for our patients and for us that we had actual patients uh, supporting the clinic patients who have gone through this uh, diagnosis, uh, just because, um, and this was the main reason for setting up the clinic, um, the patients have quite a rough time before being seen by um, a group of physicians who actually know uh, quite in depth about the uh, latest uh, in Kleinfelters and the fact that there are various issues uh, with Kleinfelters. So uh, it, it is it was quite frustrating for a lot of patients who, who did not know anyone else with Kleinfelters, who thought they were alone, um, 
and, and then had nowhere to go to because beyond what we can support in the clinic, there's lots of community uh, things that need to be addressed in client health as well because of their low testosterone. Uh, they're often in between jobs uh, if they're not therapeutically um, set and things like that. So we needed a patient liaison and uh, thankfully we have a group of um, uh, patients who've set up um, a liaison service specifically for our new diagnosis um, and our younger patients find it more difficult to, to cope with uh, the diagnosis of client falters. So it's all within one clinic attendance um, that, and it's at St. Thomas's. The reason why I mentioned this was because in our first year uh, of the adult clinic, um, we, uh, we have four clinics a year and uh, we saw 26 patients in the end and five patients had a history of DVTs and that was really high. Um, one in five patients had uh, DVTs and um, uh, although I knew that there was an issue uh, with DVTs, I did not know it was um, quite a prevalent, uh, as prevalent an issue as this was. So we set up to evaluate the VT risk um, of our KS population and we developed a survey and we collaborated with the Kleinfelter Syndrome Association of the UK and uh, separate to this, there are some very active Kleinfelter patient groups uh, in the UK as well. So we collaborated with um, uh, them. And um, we also looked at patients in our MDT clinics and our historic Kleinfelter's patients who hadn't been to the MDT clinics, which started in 2019. So in all, um, we looked at 371 patients, um, less than half of them were on testosterone, um, around the age of 43 median, and um, this was really interesting. So we found that 41 in 10,000 person years uh, was uh, the incidence of VTEs uh, much higher uh, with um, TRT. Um, and this is much, much higher, uh, as you know, than the baseline rate uh, of uh, VT incidence. 37% um, of men uh, who were treated with testosterone had a VTE versus at least one VT versus 13 um, of the untreated men. And the risk of ET increased with age and duration of TRT. Uh, we also found um, uh, that um, patients who use Sustan on um, the monthly injection of uh, testosterone had the highest uh, VT rates. And 9% of those on TRT had a VT recurrence, either a DVT or a PE, versus 2% who, who were not on TRT. And nearly 70% of patients were not aware of uh, the VT risk in KS. Now we did um, also a physician survey uh, of a um, uh, few endocrinologists, urologists uh, who, who are exposed to Kleinfelters and um, the uh, risk uh, wasn't um, clear. I mean, they, they were not aware of the risks and about half of them. So this was, this was really interesting for, for the whole group. Uh, we calculated the cumulative incidence of VTE uh, in all KS uh, by the age 70 to be 20% uh, in, in our study. And digging deeper, this is not um, an old, no, this is not a new uh, breakthrough or anything. There was uh, actually some uh, evidence of this before. This was the earliest paper that documented this in 1981 from a Scottish study uh, looking at um, uh, Kleinfeldt's patients. So they, they found a fivefold risk in VTE um, uh, in, Kleinfeld to patient groups. Um, their mode of ascertainment was um, a, a bit unique, I would say. Um, they surveyed mental hospitals and um, and other things. Um, and there's a, quite a lot of miscellaneous ascertainment as well. But uh, even then, five-fold increase in VTs and six out of 100 had uh, venous ulceration. Now, venous ulceration is really interesting because um, the first time um, I mentioned our Kleinfelter's clinic to our genetic colleagues in St. Thomas's, um, uh, Sheila, um, who's now the lead of our rare disease unit, uh, said, oh, yes, when I was, um, uh, uh, when I, when I was uh, uh, less senior than now, um, I had um, a vascular surgeon refer to me, Kleinfeld, as just on the basis of the current venous ulceration. And he was right all the time. Uh, you know, every time this patient with recurrent venous ulceration, he had Kleinfelters. And I thought, oh, this is really quite interesting. But there you go. So 6% of patients in this study had um, VTEs. 
this um, uh, uh, our data and uh, data before uh, supported by other studies. So this is a study of, of um, uh, 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 male patients in Sweden, um, and uh, with KS, the clinical incidence of ET was again uh, twenty twenty one percent. Uh, by the age of 70, so nearly exactly like our cumulative incidence. Uh, this is from a Danish register, uh, which showed at least fourfold increase uh, in VTE. And this is from a very recent uh, biobank um, study, um, which showed about 16% lifetime risk of VTE in KS. Um, so um, our researchers um, collected all the data and did a, a review which basically confirmed that the background risk of um, uh, KS versus non-KS was at least uh, three to five fold, um, and, and around one in five patients with KS by the age of 80 will suffer a VT. This is from all uh, different studies um, out there at the moment. Um, it's interesting to note that for the VT incidents, um, there is a range um, between 17 to 41. Most of them are around the, uh, uh, 35 to 40. Um, but there was one standout at 17, and I'll, I'll describe that study in more detail later on. So why do KS men have a VTE? Well, it's probably multifactorial. We don't really know at the moment. Uh, we know um, that uh, the venous thrombolysm um, can result from the Verkhoff's triad of um, uh, stasis, hemodynamic change, uh, endothelial injury, um, hypercoagulability in the blood, and we also know that um, a low testosterone male hypogonadism is associated with um, a balance uh, favoring the procoagulant um, uh, wing of um, uh, the, the clotting cascade rather than the antifibrinetic uh, change. So we don't know how uh, much this balance is influenced by metabolic derangements, testosterone treatment, for example, but we do know that KS is considered a pro-thrombotic phenotype because they have so much high incidences of metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. Uh, in terms of hypercoagulability, um, some researchers have um, proposed that this may be an excellent gene dosage issue um, because, for example, of uh, factor uh, eight uh, located, located on X chromosome. And in most studies, uh, which I'll show, um, an increase in factor eight levels uh, are seen in KS. There's also a theory about platelet reactivity and impaired fibrinolysis due to um, high levels of plasminogen activator inhibitor one. And um, uh, most um, uh, neurologists as well feel that the role of estrogen um, is very important because much higher estrogen to testosterone ratio in KS and there's aromatization of exogenous testosterone from TRT in treated KS, but really there are no available studies relating estrogen levels and thrombotic risks uh, in men with uh, KS. There's also some evidence of uh, endothelial dysfunction, um, higher apoptotic microparticles, uh, fibrin fibronectin receptor concentrations of dysfunction markers like uh, dimethyl arginine, um, which interestingly is negatively associated with total testosterone. So the more therapeutic the testosterone, um, uh, the lower the marker. So um, this, these are just a few papers because there are not many uh, looking at um, uh, potential mechanisms. So this is just six patients um, uh, from this pilot study and of six uh, had VTEs uh, in KS, four had higher fat eight, high factor nine, um, one was heterozygous for factor five from Leiden, and um, one had a post-thrombin gene mutation. Um, another uh, study uh, showed increased thrombophilic gene polymorphisms, um, like factor five Leiden, uh, anti-HFR, um, and so on. Uh, yet another study uh, uh, showed um, increased thrombin generation in a small uh, number of men, uh, both in platelet-rich and platelet-poor plasma. And the latest study um, uh, has theorized um, that um, what they've observed, which is a fibrin uh, clot lysis reduction and high levels of fibrinogen, factor 13 and plasminogen activated inhibitor type 1, um, uh, basically describes a cycle where low testosterone um, results and, um, in high body fat and 
and break down testosterone as well, which further uh, exacerbates the low testosterone. And this whole process leads to high fibrinogen, which um, um, affects fibrinolysis and increases uh, the thrombotic risk. So that's uh, the, the current uh, very poor understanding of the mechanisms of VTE in KS. What, we, uh, what um, is an added complication is that a lot of these patients are on testosterone. So uh, we know from um, uh, the BMJ paper from Martinez uh, that testosterone therapy is associated with increased risk of uh, VTE, um, especially if you're hypogonadal, it's even higher the risk uh, if you're hypogonadal, which peaks at about six months and then uh, declines uh, after that. Uh, when you look at age-adjusted models, uh, it's the same. Um, I mean, the, the first um, the research was age match, but um, this is a, a big age-adjusted model um, in America, uh, and it's the same TRT use, especially in hypogonadal associated much higher risk of VTE. But um, against that, um, uh, meta-analysis of five observational studies, including the, the two above, uh, didn't show um, uh, any differences. Um, although if you look at um, and highlight at the confidence intervals, they are uh, pretty wide. Um, so it was very hard to make that conclusion definitive. Similarly, a re very recent meta-analysis of 13 RCTs um, Although uh, the relative risk uh, uh, wasn't significant, um, uh, they as well um, emphasized that they could not rule out a clinical important risk just because of um, the range of quality of evidence and the range of um, um, uh, risk in the um, in the centiles. So that's all the way up to 2.14 uh, here in the RCT. So. What we are looking at quite carefully um, is the biggest RCT, which has just closed, which is the Traverse study of an, um, an androgel, a testosterone placement androgel. Um, it's an industry study, but um, it, um, uh, it seemed like quite a tight study, and it, it looked at long-term uh, uh, effects, um, cardiovascular, VT, and so on. It's by far the biggest RCT, so uh, the combined um, recruitment is larger than nearly as large as um, uh, all the RCTs from uh, last year's meta-analysis. So we're looking at the results of that. What, what we can say is that uh, the FDA since 2014 have uh, marked VT as a side effect to testosterone replacement therapy, and this still stands. We also know that testosterone uh, uh, treatment can cause er erythrocytosis and an elevation of hem hematocrit, especially with uh, the injectable testosterones. And that's really interesting because uh, we saw uh, in our um, patients that sustenon, the injectable testosterone, uh, created the highest risk of uh, VTE. Um, although in the past, um, uh, it was thought that no real clear evidence existed uh, between erythrocytosis and uh, VT rates, then there's more and more um, research coming uh, forward that indicates that some issue with blood viscosity and red blood cell function that might contribute. And certainly um, uh, a, a, a very recent paper um, by uh, uh, quite um, a good uh, research group from Miami um, showed that men on TRT with uh, polycythemia had a higher risk of VTE uh, than men who had normal hematocrit uh, whilst on TRT. Um, and they used 52% uh, as, as the hematocrit cutoff for polycythemia. Um, why testosterone might cause uh, uh, this issue? Well, um, uh, there is, again, um, theories, uh, different theories to this. One might be um, uh, boosting um, uh, EPO to a new set point um, and decreasing hepcidin, um, which inhibits uh, the process. Um, so you get increased iron turnover, and this all uh, potentially can lead to erythrocytosis. So this uh, it's just um, a table showing the really high rate of erythrocytosis you can get with uh, injectables. So um, this is um, our data uh, on um, uh, sustenon uh, and libido and, and all the different kinds of combinations of um, uh, testosterone replacement therapy that Klanfelter patients get. And 
we saw that uh, in, in our cohort that the um, odds ratio for VTE um, on TRT versus non-TRT was nearly four. And we had quite a lot of VTE in, in our cohort, 76 VTEs in uh, 371 KS. But this is broadly in keeping uh, with uh, most of the other studies. Now, this is uh, the Danish study, uh, the, the one that I mentioned with a much lower risk of, um, a cumulative risk of um, VTE than the other studies. Um, they did, however, see the same risk of VTE in KS versus non-KS at nearly four um, for the hazard ratio, uh, four times the risk. Um, but this was, uh, actually quite a long study of the entire Danish registry, 22 year follow-up. And uh, what they found was um, there was actually with testosterone treatment, there was an actually an insignificant reduction in risk. Uh, so their um, hazard ratio is actually 0 0.69, although you can see that there, there is quite a large range as well, all the way to 1.52 um, in terms of their confidence intervals. So. What uh, they postulated was that TRT could actually alleviate VT risk in, in their population by reversing the cycle of hypogonadism, um, causing obesity, insulin um, resistance, and so on. And although um, this uh, uh, group did show this, it's a bit limited because they only had 38 VTEs in the whole cohort, far, far lower than other groups. Um, we don't know why, maybe the much better control um, and they diagnose uh, KS much earlier um, in, um, uh, in Denmark. And they also noted in a previous study that thrombin generation was lower in the treated um, group uh, versus the untreated group uh, in KS. Uh, they didn't see any risk uh, difference between TRT routes of administration, but it's interesting because when we dig deep into the, their data, they didn't have any erythrocytosis as well um, uh, in, uh, in, in the patients that um, had VTEs, although these were very small numbers, as I mentioned before. Um, also an interesting was that time to um, VTE from TRT initiation was about seven years, um, broadly similar to our group and, and things like that. And it's in much, much longer than the peak uh, of um, VTE that uh, the observational studies of non-KS patients have shown. So uh, again, a, a postulate is that TRT might reduce the risk of VTE um, uh, in early adulthood, uh, where a lot of these patients get started on uh, uh, TRT. So lots of unknowns, as I have uh, just shown you. Uh, lots more research needs to be done. We are uh, just at the um, uh, at the understanding phase of things. Um, and as I said, I'm, I'm here in America because we are presenting a lot of the data from, from our clinic that will be hopefully useful and um, uh, trigger much more research into to this field. But this just goes to show how important, and, and I echo what uh, my previous panelists have said, how important multidisciplinary um, uh, multi-specialty approaches to uh, to genetic disease are um, we wouldn't have really uh, honed in on this point if um, uh, we didn't see it so often present in our own clinic um, and and now we know we've um, produced um, lots of patient booklets on this about science and uh, what to do and so on but more needs to be done I mean we, we need to understand more about the mechanism and we're working with um, uh, definitely on um, uh, potentially more um, basic science research so that we can advise and, and time a thromboprophylaxis, for example, in this patient group. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, if you want to donate to Kleinfelter's research for the Kleinfelter's Association, that's a QR code. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you for a great session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tet. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. I just think we have to ask you one question. Uh, you have shown us you've got increased risk of VTE in Kleinfelters. If we now we're very aware of Kleinfelters, think a patient might have Kleinfelters in our VTE clinic, how should we manage them? Because I don't think that we're adequately trained 
to manage all the consequences of the diagnosis, which include infertility. Um, how would you suggest we approach them? So um, first of all, if you suspect a patient might have Klinefelter's, uh, you can just do his uh, hormone level. So um, fasting, early morning testosterone, FSH, LH. Um, um, the, all the testosterone might not be reduced um, uh, in, in the mosaics, but almost all have a high FSH. And all you mm -hmm. need to do is examine, yeah, examine the testicle because if he's an adult patient with very small testicles and he's got high FSH, the likelihood right. is that if he's no other history of undescent testes right. or anything okay. like that, I think in a modern thrombosis clinic, uh, and many of them are run by women now, we would be reluctant to examine testicles, but perhaps we'd do FSH, LH, uh, yeah. and see where we get to. Okay, well, thank you. That's you, an amazing lecture. Sorry, we want to say one if more you thing. Have, um, if you have a, a confirmed Kleinfelter's diagnosis uh, with a karyotype, then send it to us because we want to see everyone. Uh, with client filters in the UK so that we can enroll them in um, a long-term follow-up program where they're not lost to, to follow up for VTEs and things like that. So we've just set this up um, in St. Thomas's as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to bring this session to a close and also National Thrombosis Week live sessions to a close. I want to say thank you to all the speakers and attendees. Uh, there will be a recording of this available shortly on the website. I have to say thank you to the whole faculty of the 54 speakers that we have had, including those here. Thank you very much. We've had over 2,000 attendees from 53 countries. We've had sponsors whose stands are in the exhibition hall and they offer lots of information and resources. Please do uh, visit them before the 31st of May. Uh, we've had some fabulous e-posters as well uh, and I'm sure we're going to continue and expand that in the future. And really I have to say thank you to Thrombosis UK for organizing it all, for all the medical leads, for organizing all these symposia um, it's bigger and better than last year, and we're hoping for the same the next year. And uh, I'd just like Jo to show herself so that we can give her a virtual clap. Jo, well done. Thank you so teamwork. much. Always teamwork, but it's been a roller coaster, but a fantastic week. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So goodbye, everybody, uh, and see you at the next National Thrombosis Week, if not before. Bye.